Thank you very much. It's a great pleasure to talk about the research of my good friend Raghu Rajan, who's the winner of this year's Deutsche Bank Prize in Financial Economics, and who not only is one of the profession's very best economists uh, in all fields, but who has exactly the right values when he chooses problems to work on, how to approach them, and how to take them to uh, execution in reality. So my colleague at Chicago since 1991, certainly my most valuable colleague over that period, his work has a, uh, an important effect and impact on the way other people do research in economics and finance, uh, on policy making, and all this is done with a clear view of how the research topics and the results can help make the world a, a better place uh, with an actual sub-focus on how it can make uh, it a better place to allow an exit uh, of those currently in poverty uh, to, to get out. Raghu's research has always focused on important problems, and there is not a single methodology you can pick up, apart from extreme care, uh, you can pick up across his work. A lot of it is economic theory, some of it's game theory. There's empirical description, uh, there's empirical methodology, historical analysis, and policy evaluation. Uh, I'll be brief in talking about his personal background in part because if you just read the press since his appointment uh, in the Reserve Bank of India, you can learn many of his private details. Uh, the discussion in the Indian press recently about uh, how he's so fit and handsome, let's put it mildly, uh, it's not quite what they said, uh, has been quite interesting. Uh, it, it's also interesting there was no such discussion when he was merely a professor at the University of Chicago. Uh, so there are one of two explanations for this. Either central bank presidents are much less attractive group than University of Chicago professors, <laughs> but I looked around and I don't think too much of that one. Uh, or that basically the press doesn't know what to say when an incredibly qualified uh, person gets appointed uh, as a new central bank governor, so they have to find something else to, to talk about. Uh, I can tell you a little about uh, personal aspects of Raghu you may not know. Uh, Raghu and Radhika, his brilliant and charming wife, have uh, two children, uh, one who just finished college and one who just started high school, who are extremely interesting, integrated children who will be uh, participants and contributors to society, I predict, uh, at the level of their parents. Uh, Raghu is an incredibly fair man. I would say within the uh, University of Chicago and the Booth School in particular, he has uh, hardly uh, an enemy despite taking strong positions on controversial uh, uh, views. He's viewed as the voice of reason within our faculty. Uh, he's not an overconfident person, so I can share one anecdote. When Raghu uh, was considering accepting our rookie offer uh, uh, when he was finishing at MIT to join our faculty, we had a discussion about uh, how difficult it might be to get tenure at the University of Chicago. So uh, I told him I had a similar problem, and the nice thing was it was a very safe and unrisky decision because I figured the chance of getting tenure was zero, so that meant there was no risk at all, and so well, your risk aversion didn't enter the, 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 uh, the, the consideration. Uh, as it turned out, Raghu was one of the few people not to get promoted to associate professor within, within the school. And if I told him that was going to happen, I think he probably would, would have not have accepted the job. Uh, the reason he didn't get promoted to associate professor is he got promoted directly from assistant professor to full professor, uh, which is almost unprecedented. I can think of like Andre Schleifer and, and Rob Vishny as the other two people who ever did that. Uh, and he did this without asking for it. I think it was a surprise to him. He wasn't threatening to get a job someplace else. Uh, it's just that when you know, the faculty went and read his work, it was clear that he already had enough to get tenure at least two times based on the amount of contribution. So it was a little silly to, to promote him twice. So Raghu's work has had a significant impact on the world. And as I mentioned, I'd say that is his over, you know, the, the, the thing that drives him is to have an impact on the world, to save the world to some extent. Uh, and you know, that explains why, despite, you know, being tremendously research productive, he thought it was incredibly important to take the research director position at the International Monetary Fund and why he's now stepped up to serve as the uh, Reserve Bank of India's governor. Uh, his research is outstanding and it's incredibly broad. Uh, I'm mainly going to talk about the part that I know best, uh, the work on banking, uh, but I must start with one of his truly path-breaking papers the paper Financial Dependence and Growth, co-authored with Luigi Zingales in the 1998 American Economic Review. 
Luigi might conceivably be too modest to describe it, but let me mention uh, that the paper found a cross-sectional within-country way to measure the effects of financial constraints and limited financial development, and at the same time rehabilitate a field which had pretty much been banished as uh, impossibly, uh, impossible to have any learning from, the field of cross-country regressions uh, on financial development. So, Raghu and Luigi developed an industry measure of the financial dependence of an industry by how much money an industry in the United States had to raise over time, whether they had to go and raise outside funding. So that's their measure of financial dependence. If that number was bigger, it was a relatively financial de financially dependent industry. If it was smaller, it was less financially dependent. So the idea is that U.S. firms face smaller or maybe zero uh, you know, financial constraints and uh, this is one of the great benefits of hiring people who are not Americans, as most of the people who teach at the University of Chicago now, that we hire in a world pool. If this was Americans, you couldn't get away with doing, saying that you know, the U.S. is the unconstrained country. But it turns out it was sort of right. And uh, it turns out that this measure produced tremendously strong results in their paper, uh, overturned a lot of existing results. Uh, and sort of removed the doubts about cross-country regression studies on skeptics who were mainly concerned about omitted variables and reverse causality. Uh, this research has uh, stood the test of time, and it's become one of the standard tools that empirical researchers in this area use. It's generated not just citations, but many, many, many papers, hundreds of papers that have actually used this technique uh, to get very useful results. We've already heard about some of Raghu's other great accomplishments, so I won't have time to talk about them, given my time is going to run out. I'll just mention them, you know, his amazing e policy work, work in India, uh, in working on financial deregulation a while ago and helping as a policy advisor recently, and now his Reserve Bank work. Uh, his work on regulation within the Squam Lake Group, uh, his work at the IMF, his recent book and his book with Luigi Zingales, or even his famous Jackson Hole speech on uh, warning about the roots of the crisis. He's won too many prizes for me to list them, so I'm going to talk about the work that I know best. That's his work on banking. Uh, and in the last decade and a half, some of that has been co-authored with me, so I know some more about that part, too. Uh, so the research area is on banking, short-term debt, and monetary policy, uh, hopefully some of which may come uh, to use in his day job uh, in the next year or two. So Raghu's very first paper, uh, actually one of his best, was his thesis uh, from MIT on insiders and outsiders and the choice between informed and arm's length debt. So that was one of the very first papers relating financial contracting to the strength of bargaining power uh, between borrowers and lenders and workouts. And it showed that short-term debt was the way to go if the bargaining power of a borrower is relatively strong relative to lenders, while long-term dominates if it's flipped around. I would say, and I'm not explicitly say this in the papers, that this insight led to a whole series of ideas that uh, led to a, a, a group of path-breaking papers that Raghu wrote with Mitchell Peterson uh, of Northwestern University now, on the value of having some exclusivity and mon monopoly power in bank lending. So competition is always thought to be the thing you want more of, but that's if markets are perfect. So the point that came out in the work with Mitch Peterson is that you actually might have more access to finance by new startup firms if there's at least some exclusivity and monopoly power in uh, bank lending relationships. The reason is you sort of want to be able to lose a little money in the early periods of lending to a company, which you then make up um, uh, from the companies that succeed and do well. So the reason, if you, know, if you don't have access to writing complete contracts, lots of equity and things like that, if you're in an environment where, the, say, legal enforcement is that, that equity contracts don't work well, the only way to do that is essentially have some monopoly power because you, if you lose money for a few periods and then the company does well, they'll just switch to another lender and you won't get the profits in the future. Anticipating that, you'd be, you as a bank with very lots of competition would be unwilling to lend up front. Uh, so some monopoly power serves as a substitute for equity and fancy contingent contracts. Uh, this area opened up a whole literature 
uh, that has become very productive on relationship lending, empirical work on relationship lending. Uh, so this, they had, Raghu and Mitch had some empirical work on small business lending and showed how as a relationship gets longer, the interest rate doesn't fall as quickly for successful firms in, in areas where there's less banking competition, and that turned out to be a good thing. So this led Raghu and Mitch to study the effects, the local cross-sectional effects of the distance the, uh, between uh, banks and their uh, companies that borrow from them, which in addition to documenting the importance of bank lending, has become another standard instrument, much like the, the one with Luigi Zingales, that's used to try to look at the empirical effects of bank lending and overcoming certain types of shocks or uh, financial constraints. I also want to mention Raghu's outstanding policy work with Jeremy Stein and Neil Kashup, which contained one of the first coherent calls for more use of contingent capital, now used by Swiss and some United Kingdom banks, which I hope will be used by more banks uh, around the world. So let me move on to discuss the work that I did with Raghu, which is largely about so much, why there's so much short-term debt, things that look like demand deposits, uh, using to finance the financial sector compared, say, to operating companies. Okay. We knew before we started our research that there could be problems with runs when you have short-term debt financing long-term illiquid assets. Uh, but we wanted to understand why this mismatch of liquidity is so prevalent and whether this was some kind of a problem, whether this was a good thing or, or, or what. So our idea that was uh, new to, um, uh, the new idea that we developed was to consider why these loans that are illiquid are illiquid in the first place. And our answer was that there were important sort of lender-specific skills. You know, it's like you need to think of firm-specific capital. That's about machines. We were thinking about firm-specific, lender-specific financial contracts like loans. And this specificity was either due to relationship lending or to something like loan monitoring, something else skill-based that the financial uh, bank, the financial sector bank, uh, did. So in this case, there's a problem with using too much long-term debt or equity to finance uh, banks because these instruments don't limit the rents or bonuses that bank insiders can then capture. Uh, if a relationship lender has to use his or her skill to effect a transfer between the borrowers and the lenders, which is what relationship lending is all about, we showed that short-term debt and the threat of a run on the short-term debt, if any lender ever anticipated that the bank was anywhere close to the point of default or asking for concessions in a workout, uh, that would essentially deter the bank from uh, asking for concessions or taking actions that might lead to a run. The implication of this is that ex post discipline will allow financial institutions to raise a bigger percentage of the value against an illiquid asset, at least for a very, very short time, than any more stable capital structure. So these unstable short-term debt financial structures, even though they sort of have runs sometimes, it's the prospect and the threat of the runs that makes them good things in the first place. So we applied this framework to a bunch of applications. Uh, the advantages and disadvantages of raising bank capital requirements, the effects of using interest rate policy as a financial stability device, and how banks as a result are induced to use an excessive amount of short-term leverage when central banks commit to keep interest rates low for prolonged periods. Some of our work, such as our 2005 paper on liquidity shortages and banking crises, which links solvency and illiquidity crises, seem to me to be re very relevant to understand the 2007 to 2009 period. More recently, we studied problems of allowing undercapitalized banks, somewhat undercapitalized banks, to choose which assets they want to sell, they would choose to sell if a crisis hasn't yet occurred. So the period like 2007, where there was sort of a crisis brewing, illiquidity was drying up. In those periods, uh, it turns out that the banks kept their illiquid assets and if they had sort of slowly unwound some of their illiquid asset positions in those periods, presumably the system would not have melted down as severely as it did in 2008. So let me use this line of research on the pluses and minuses of short-term debt to illustrate why Raghu is such an outstanding policy economist in addition to theorist and empiricist. <laughs> 
Overall, this research is a framework that suggests that bank capital structure is naturally and beneficially largely short-term debt with a reasonable-sized capital buffer. Unregulated, banks choose too much short-term leverage and a capital requirement is needed, but the problem with designing a capital requirement, a financial regulation, contingent capital, whatever uh, solution you're getting to financial instability is that you want to get just the right amount of short-term debt. Not too much, not too little, sort of the Goldilocks amount just right. Uh, and that's actually a very complicated and tricky proposition to implement. Raghu's view, and, and mine as well, is that we need more careful empirical work on the effects of bank capital requirements on bank behavior before we have any reasonable prediction of what a huge increase in capital requirements would do to the health or stability of the financial system. This illustrates Raghu's honesty and care in not overclaiming what research has shown. He makes a point always of admitting to policymakers the limits of our knowledge in the profession. This, what I would call first do no harm approach, uh, influences how he does his research as well as his recent comment that the Reserve Bank of India has no magic bullet to instantly stop the Indian currency crisis. He's what I would call a two-handed economist. So on the one hand and on the other hand, and he delivers, despite this, that could be you just end up with blah, you end up with no advice, despite being a two-handed economist and not being sort of a personal lobbyist for his own research, he manages to deliver practical advice that's based on his research. Much of the recent debate about changing capital requirements is between what I would call one-handed economists. The banking industry argues that any increase in capital requirements at all will mean the end of most corporate lending by banks. On the other hand, other side, sorry, on the other side, are one-handed economists who sometimes state that a 30% capital requirement or even higher would not reduce bank activity below the optimal level. There are even a few people who say 100% capital requirement wouldn't be a problem. Uh, that would be a little difficult to be a bank with 100% capital requirement, but I think that person's not a big fan of banks. Uh, the research that Raghu and I have done suggests that this may be incredibly wrong and it could have very large bad effects. We have no reason, based on empirical research, theory, or anything, uh, to predict that we would not cause major economic problems by an extreme and instant move to a 30% capital requirement. We see that the market may well be distorted by bailout prospects, and I think almost everyone would agree that 8% capital is too low. But there may be good reasons to think about a smaller change than an immediate move to 30% overnight. So basically, again, Based on what Raghu said, I agree. We, may, we need better empirical work on capital. Uh, it's pointless to argue one theory versus another. Raghu wrote a very nice op-ed piece in the Project Syndicate back in March of this year. It illustrates why Raghu Rajan is such an, a wonderful choice for the Deutsche Bank Prize in financial economics. His work is extremely creative and rigorous. It's very applied, and he works hard to apply it to the world, and now with an especially large weight on uh, the welfare of the people of India. Thank you very much.